Today, I'd like to talk about this first reading in a particular way. It talks about this, this Emmanuel prophecy. And sometimes we just kind of hear this, but we don't really know the context of where it's coming from. And so I thought it'd be good just to kind of dig into what's going on in the book of the prophet Isaiah, what's going on historically that's leading to this particular moment. Because it also shows the response of King Ahaz and you can compare that to the response of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So King Ahaz is speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and actually the Lord is speaking to him first. And it's during this time called the Syro-Ephraimite War. And this is a, a, a time even secular historians talk about. You have the rise of the Assyrian kingdom, and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But then you also have the kind of squabbling that's happening in the Palestinian area of the land of Ephraim, which is, in a sense, the northern tribes of Israel. Remember how there was a break that happened after Solomon? You have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So King Ahaz is the king of Judah, of the southern kingdom. And Syria and Ephraim are, in a sense, wanting to have a coalition to fight against Assyria because Assyria is getting bigger and bigger and they need to band together. And so they ask King Ahaz first, hey, you want to be a part of our team? And Ahaz says, no. And he's, in a sense, getting tempted to be a part of Assyria's team. And so the Syrians and the northern kingdom of Israel say, well, if you're not going to do it the easy way, well, then we're going to declare war on you in order to kick you out and put a puppet king in so that he can do what we want and we can band together in fighting against Assyria. But you see, the problem with all of this, none of them are turning to God. They're trying to figure out how to survive this difficult situation without any recourse to God. Don't we do this in our lives, in our society? God is sort of this kind of last-ditch kind of thing. We kind of figure it, try to figure it out ourselves. Even there's that sort of funny thing where it's like, well, we've tried everything else. All we can do is pray. Have you ever heard that before? And it, it sounds like kind of a nice idea. It's like, well, let's turn to God now. But we should be doing that at the beginning. And so Ahaz is trying to figure out politically what's the best way of going. And this is where Isaiah is coming to him. And he first talks about this prophecy of saying, trust in the Lord first. He will help you against these two warring peoples of Syria and the northern kingdom. He'll defend you against them, so don't go in league against, with them. But also, don't turn to Assyria for help, because even though they might help you in the short term, they're going to ultimately enslave and there'll be bad consequences in the long term. And so that's where we're at in this moment. And the Lord is saying, I want to give you a sign that you can trust me. He says, ask for a sign from the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as the netherworld or as high as the sky. In other words, King Ahaz, what will help you trust me? Notice how, how daring this, 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 this call of the Lord saying, Ahaz, I want to help you in this. Like, ask. Like, what? 
I mean, how many times does God say, ask me for a sign? You know, normally it's like, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. But here he's like saying, I, I want to give you a sign. And notice what King Ahaz does. It sounds very pious. I will not ask. I will not tempt the Lord. And yet he's, he's in a sense covering himself because he doesn't want a sign from God. It's that experience, that stubbornness of heart in which, have you ever had that experience where you know what you want to do? You know, whether it's, this is the trajectory, and I know that this is leading down a road towards sin. There's a temptation here, but by golly, I know what I want, and so God, don't you dare give me something that's going to change that course. But we kind of rationalize that. We kind of, like, make it as though, you know, it's, it's a good thing, and it's like, no, 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 I can kind of take care of this. But really, it's this stubbornness that goes right down to the core of saying, I won't serve you, God. I'm doing this because I understand politically what I have to do, and I know that in order for me to fight against these two guys that are coming from the north, I have to ally myself with Assyria. Sorry, God, but I think I know how to deal with this myself. I'm a king, after all. And this is my people to take care of. And this is then what Isaiah says. He says, listen, O house of David. So remember, this is the family tree of Jesus. It's always important to remember that, that God still can bring great good out of, I mean, even, even swindlers like this. This is like the great, 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 great grandfather of Joseph, the son of Mary, or the, 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 the husband of Mary. It's really interesting to think about. But Isaiah is just speaking at this moment, and he says, Listen, O house of David, he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. He's speaking this voice of prophecy. Is it not enough for you to weary men? Must you also weary my God? So Isaiah is worn out, saying, this is not going to help you. And he just sees the stubbornness just clamp in. Have you ever had that experience where, where you, you see someone that you're trying to help, and you just see them, like, go into a stubborn mode, and it's like, I, I, can't, I can't get in. I can't reach in. And there's this weariness. But then he says, must you also weary God? It's not enough to, to weary me, but... The Lord himself is saying, I'm, I want to give you a sign, but you're not open to it. But he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you this sign, which is interesting. He still gives the sign because it's a sign for the house of David. It's a sign that will bring hope to those who are open to hear it. And Ahaz is not open. But it is the sign, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, which is really the answer that sadly Ahaz couldn't see right in front of him. God with us. Jesus Christ is that powerful sign, that son of a virgin, who is God is with us in a way that the people of Israel would never have guessed. In this time, even, even Isaiah probably didn't understand fully the depth of what this actually meant. Because there were many, many times of the closeness of God, of saying, I will be with you, you are my people. But for God to actually become one of us, that's a whole nother level that Isaiah wouldn't have even dreamed of. And it shows how God is always never outdone in generosity, even in the midst of our stubbornness of heart. In the stubbornness of the king of Judah, of the house of David, the very line of Jesus Christ, God still speaks the promise into that bloodline, saying, I will actually go into your line, King Ahaz, even though you can't see it. And I'm going to heal your people. Even when you made choices ultimately that led to their destruction. Because you see what 
happens at this moment. Ahaz chooses Assyria. Isaiah is saying, please, unless your faith is firm, this is the part that comes after this. He says, the Lord will take care of you. But unless your faith is firm, you will not be firm. Unless you stand in your faith, you won't be able to stand. And then it says right after that, Ahaz then sent ambassadors to Assyria, saying, please help me. I need to fight against the Syrians and the northern kingdom of Israel. And Assyria took him up on that and actually did defend the, um, King Ahaz from that assault that was coming down, but it came with a very terrible consequence. Because when Assyria came, it wiped out all of the northern kingdom. So Ahaz's brothers, in a sense, that even though they were broke apart by civil war, because of Ahaz's decision not to trust in the Lord, Assyria came and wiped out the ten tribes of Israel. These brothers of Jacob, or the, the sons of Jacob, the sons of Israel, these tribes were wiped out and they went into exile and were never seen again. And you just had Judah in the south, and I believe it was Benjamin as well, and they were together, and that's all that remained. And Assyria ultimately then starts to push down upon the ally, because remember, evil has this way of kind of going and you make a deal with the devil and all of a sudden he's coming right at the very gates. And you hear the story of Hezekiah later on. This is not in this part here. But Hezekiah, even though he isn't he, he isn't doing the right thing for a long time. He's trying, to, he's trying to buy time. He's trying to figure out how to do this politically, how to give money to the Assyrians. And the Assyri he like gives them all like this treasure. And the Assyrians are like, thank you. We're still going to blow you up. And finally, Hezekiah, in the 11th hour, wakes up and says, I need to go to God right now. And you have this beautiful moment as the enemy is at the gates I mean, it's something like a Lord of the Rings kind of thing. The enemy is at the gates, and Hezekiah finally goes before the temple, prostrates himself, and says, Lord, I have no one else to turn to but you. And Isaiah says, because you come to God first, thus says the Lord, the enemy will not get through the gate. And in fact, there is this plague that strikes all the Assyrian army wipes out so many of them, so they actually have to leave. But then Hezekiah, after this moment, he then starts welcoming the ambassadors of Babylon. And he shows the treasure trove of Israel, of Jerusalem temple. And the Babylonians are like, hmm, very interesting. And Isaiah then comes to Hezekiah and says, Hezekiah, what have you done? You are trusting in the Lord. He saved you from Assyria, and now you're, in a sense, doing the same thing again. You're trying to make these political alliances. You're not trusting in the Lord to be your king. And so thus says the Lord, the southern kingdom will fall by Babylon. And so you have this whole story of Israel. Isn't this the story of our hearts? It's so much our story. When we turn to the Lord first, there is salvation. There is healing. But it's so easy for us to turn to other means, whether it's trusting in politics. And if we just have the right person, they're going to save us and everything will be taken care of. And we've kind of seen how that works out. And yet the Lord is saying, trust me. Me first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And everything else will be added unto you. Everything else will fall in its place. But if you don't put me first, everything will fall apart. So let's ask the Lord in our heart. Let's really do a heart check. 
and say, where am I like Ahaz? Where am I like Hezekiah in his good moments, but then in his not so good moments? And let's ask for the grace to truly trust God first.